Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Your Questions Answered. Um, it's a podcast we do weekly with Pastor Steve and various other guests. We've had mm-hmm. Stephanie on here too and kind of mixed up switching chairs around, so it's been fun. Yeah. And the, the whole purpose of it is to kind of dive into some, some things um, just to go a little deeper. So it's just encouraging a posture of asking questions and really diving into um, where um, yeah, God, God takes us each week. So it's been fun, very different things each mm-hmm. time. But uh, I mean, Can I jump in and say something? Sure. I was yeah. just, it just struck me when you said that, that I know that um, there's always discussion, I hope, after every message that's preached, whether I am or guest ministry or anyone like that. And I, I know that some groups will get off into, well, I think what he meant was this, and this is your opportunity to find out what the preacher actually meant. So when we have a guest ministry, we'll always be doing this with them too. And um, I'm always curious, every preacher always wants to know, so did that word land or, you know, based on the face, the look on the people, um, I don't even know if that made sense or if they're going to stone the heretic or what. So this is your opportunity to ask absolutely anything. There's nothing off topic or nothing that can't be questioned. And that's kind of the heart we have. I didn't write the Bible. Nobody that preached today wrote the Bible. So we're always ready to, you know, let's have some discussion about it. That's what, that's what this is all about. Awesome. It was Todd's idea, and I thought it was a great one. Great. Well, we're having fun with this. So, um, yeah, so the, the questions that came in, the questions that I have here for you today are, um, you talked about the gospel message on Sunday, mm-hmm. which was awesome, too. I think it's great to always be refreshed and regrounded in that, too. Yeah. Um, but you talked about how we repent from dead works, um, and yeah. it's a two-part repentance or Maybe there's usually a, one or the other, a mixture of both of these, but the, the one work that we repent of is sinful works. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is of dead religious works. Mm-hmm. And you said that was more works that are self-righteous, you know, doing things on your own to try to get, earn your own way to heaven, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, the question I have, maybe this is one that's impossible to answer, but in your experience, do you generally find one work is harder to get out of than the other? As far as, um, you know, I guess maybe the prodigal son story, there's a story of the two, the two sons, I think, are kind of in the, that category. The yeah. younger son's kind of the sinful works, older son's kind of the dead religious works. What, yeah, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, don't, it's, uh, I guess it's hard to judge which one's harder to get out of. Okay. You know, for every sinful, you know, somebody who's really lost in a life of sin, that's how I came to Christ. Um, we have addicts that never get set free. We have mm-hmm. you know, people that stay lost and broken. They've heard the gospel again and again, but slide back into the sin that they came from. Mm-hmm. You know, the biblical term is backsliding. Um, but then it, it can be hard if you grew up in a religious environment. You've had what I would call like an inoculation against the full gospel. Mm-hmm. So there's a sense of um, like a placebo effect. You go through the motions, you go to church every week, but there's not a transformation of the heart. There's not a You know, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, he said, they that worship will worship in spirit and in truth. And until you come into that, you haven't really had that born again experience. And even the term born again um, has lost its meaning in a lot of circles of what's called church. So a lot of, you know, liturgical, denominational that have not continued to be refreshed in the word of God over the centuries uh, many times have lost that, that there's a, you can go to church every Sunday and be faithful with it and believe with all your heart that that's what there is. That's all that there is to it. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, you brought up the older son, like the older son. They're living in the father's house. They're close, but not experiencing the father at all. And that, um, and that can be hard, harder to break free from maybe because you've got this belief. You know, I've ministered to people the gospel and they say, oh, I, I believe that. Um, you know, let's say they're Catholic or they're, you know, they were raised like I was Episcopal or something like that. Oh, I believe all of that, but it has no transformative effect. Mm. The gospel should change us from the inside out. So it means to be born again. And it, it's definitely harder to minister to somebody like that okay. than it is somebody who is broken and destitute. You know, like that Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord's on me because it anointed me to preach good news to the afflicted. Hmm. Afflicted ones receive the message and at least listen more than somebody who thinks, oh, I know that already. I learned that in Sunday school when I was eight years old. But you're not living it. And that's how I was. I had a season in life where I'd had an encounter with God like that. I learned that God loved me. And so when those crazy born-again types on campus at college began to minister to me, 
I, I was able to push them off with, oh yeah, I know all of that already. And it wasn't until I read the book of James and where he says, oh, you believe that there's one God? Good, that's, that's really good. The demons believe that too. And they tremble. And that's the trap of dead religion yeah. that it comes down to, well, I believe that. I, you know, I memorize the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and everybody who grows up in a church that has a catechism approach mm -hmm. to things. You believe that mentally. But it always comes back to answering the question, what about the cross? Have you picked up your cross? And who is Jesus? Mm. I mean, who is he really? Not in a belief system. You know, it's um, been pointed out that the demons were the first ones to recognize Jesus. Mm. And you, know, you see it in all the Gospels. He'd be walking down the street and they're begging for mercy, crying out to him. So it's not, it's not just a belief in... Yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He's all of these things. The demons believe that. It's what has that done to get in you and transform you into something brand new. And I, th I think, too, of, you know, when Jesus was ministering to people, He, he did reserve his, his toughest words, I think. Well, mm -hmm. most of His tough words for the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who were yeah. leading others into you know, sinful, well, not sinful, but rather the dead works of religion. So it's not, mm -hmm. it was probably more so the, the people who were doing the teaching, who were leading others astray, that he was yeah. really concerned about. Yeah, um, they, he, his harshest words are for them. Yeah. Brood of vipers. Yeah, whitewashed I mean, tombs. the name calling. Yeah. Yeah. He'd, yeah. He didn't mince words with them. And you're right, because they did, they created this placebo effect. Hmm. Like, you know, I'm giving you something with the claim that this is the key to eternal life. Mm -hmm. This is the key to connection with God. But it had no power in it. It has no life-transforming effect. And that's, that's, as, that's more dangerous than, well, than anything. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, mm. I think the more I look at that tree and you know, read, and read the scripture and see what was the effect of that tree, that was the tree of dead religion. Choose for yourself good and evil. You, you will now be your own judge of what's right and what's wrong. Okay. Uh, you don't yeah. need God as a source. You know, the tree of life was how we're meant to live. Eat from the tree of life. Have communion with God. Walk with Him in paradise. And you'll know everything you need to know. And you'll never be wrong. Hmm. But here's this alternative tree where you don't need God anymore. You can become a God unto yourself. Uh, you'll be like God was the promise, which of course was a ridiculous promise because they already were made in God's image. But that's hmm. another topic. Um, but it's this false security, a false sense of security that because I have life, or because I believe this, I have life. And that's why Jesus, when confronting the Pharisees, I believe is an extended hand invitation. He said, you search the scriptures, believing for in them you have life. But these are they which testify of me. In other words, if you really understood these scriptures, which you claim is the key to eternal life, then you'd recognize you've got life in front of you right now. Yeah. The only one in whom is life. And, um, and that's the trap of all dead religion. It's, um, you know, in Hebrews 6 is where that term comes from, dead works. Repentance from dead works is the first of the seven elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. And some translations, I think, wrongly word it, repentance from acts that lead to death. Okay. Which is taking, you know, the wages of sin is death. I mean, that is a truth. Um, but I think it overly defines it. And we forget that the ones who are just as likely to reject the reality of Christ are those that have a religious structure built in their lives, mm. which gives them that false sense of security. That's good. Thank you. Mm. I appreciate that question. And the other question was about just the the choices we make. And I wrote down your words that I wanted to, I don't uh -oh. you love when I repeat your words? Um, but <clears throat> he said um, that we're not born with a default position of already having been judged and dead. We are born with a choice. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think what you were going for was like a, a the mental state that we have. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, I had it in the Ephesians 2 open here. It says we, we were dead in our offenses and sins. That's a reality, of course. But then there's also the our internal mindset too is that we are are born you said with a choice so could you explain that a little more what is that what does yeah it mean? yeah i guess it you know obviously all my calvinist friends would be unfriending me right now on all right. you know whatever social media we've got together but i yeah the balance of scripture i don't believe teaches let's say for example you're born a baby dies in the womb or a baby's born and dies a premature death 
having no opportunity to understand, much less respond to the message of the gospel. This is a big can of worms that I'm going to be careful not to fully crack open here. But um, I, knowing that God is good and that God is just, um, and knowing what the balance of Scripture shares about various people, um, we're not born just so that God could punish us. I mean, the thought that God could take a six-month-old who, you know, all they know is goo goo ga ga, and that's about the, all the intellect they have, that, um, well, that's just one more who's, who was known in Christ since before the foundations of the earth, but their only purpose was to die and, mm. you know, go to the lake of fire. So I think it requires a deeper study in the Word. I, I generally don't go deep into this subject, for one thing, because I got tired of it when I was in seminary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sitting around the table, I was sharing with you earlier, sitting around the table in the cafeteria, we'd have these endless conversations about things like that, which if there was a clear answer to it, we'd already know. People have been studying the Scriptures for 2,000 years now, yeah. and there are certain things that are very clear. They don't require interpretation. They're just flat out true. And then there are other things that either Scripture is silent on or it's not clear enough to make an adamant absolutely about it. So, you know, I always respond when we get into this discussion with somebody because the problem is that people will use this thought that, you know, we're born with a sinful nature is the term we use in the church. And um, some will say, all right, what about people who never heard the gospel? What about people who are mentally, you know, deficient in some way and, hmm. you know, can't respond uh, and you never hear they can't speak or something like that. What about all of them? And I generally avoid that conversation. I might be getting off topic here. Right. But I avoid that conversation and just say, well, the real question of life, since you and me are talking right now, is, as Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. So all of those other questions, they're interesting. Campfire conversation or over a cup of coffee or something like that, provided that you already know that God is good and God is just. Those are the two balancing features of God that come to play when it comes to His judgment, which there is. There, there is a judgment. So I think uh, what I was getting at and what I wanted to make clear was that um, nobody standing before God will be able to say, well, I never had opportunity to respond to you. I gotcha. You made me, you know, I was born sinful. I never heard the good news. I never had a chance to reply, you know, respond to an invitation to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. So it's unjust that I'm standing before you right now. Um, I believe that since the first Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we all partake of that tree. Now, there's some doctrinal discussion about is there an age of accountability, which some believe pretty adamantly about. There's some streams of Christian tradition that have like 12 years old when the Jewish bar mitzvah would have been. I don't, the scriptures don't say enough to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But my point is that if we're going to stand before a righteous judge, it's going to be based on choices that we've made, not based on a nature that we carried. Mm. So like Ephesians says, for we were objects of wrath, as were some others, and some will use that as a justification. See, we're born with a sinful nature. I, nobody can deny that we're born with a bent towards sin. You don't have to teach a two-year-old to be selfish. It's just in them. The rare exception are the ones we call, you know, what did I do to deserve you? Yeah. Uh, but there's still, you know, there is a, a bent towards sin. But I would also say there's a bent toward righteousness. Mm. There is still, you know, like a, a remnant of being made in the image and likeness of God in everyone. So there's a sense of justice in everyone. There's a, a sense of love in everyone. There's a sense of a desire, you know, for community and for fellowship and to love and to be loved. And, uh, you know, kids share without being required to, for example. So it's not just that we have, like, we're born evil, villainous, monstrous, the way some people talk about two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> That what, what we're going to stand and give account for are the decisions that we made along the way. Yeah. And um, that's the bottom line. Again, to debate whether children are born objects of wrath, so a six-year-old who dies because of all the sin they committed till they return six, well, that's going to condemn them to the lake of fire. Um, I think all of that's not worth the time that it takes to have the conversation. What matters, again, is 
you have a choice right now because mm -hmm. I just presented you with the truth of who Jesus is. What's your decision? And then to take that and to view, I think a good picture is imagine you're a lifeguard and you have a, a beach and you're looking out and there are people drowning out there. Are you just going to stand idle while they drown or are you going to do whatever you can to go and rescue them? That's the good news that we're responsible to preach. Hmm. And um, so, as you can tell, I'm avoiding going any deeper because, I mean, we could do a whole separate podcast and I could teach on the doctrines yeah. related to salvation and, you know, who's saved, who's not saved. Um, when it comes to practical, everyday living, it's not ours to judge who's saved or not. It's ours to share good news and bring good news, meaning bring the goods that come with that good news hmm. and uh, leave it at that. But I, I don't believe, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk in the church that almost amplifies the sinful nature and even believes that that sinful nature carries over on the other side of the cross to our, you know, our new life in Christ and amplifies that so much that we still believe that we're by nature sinners, even though we're saved. Mm. And so um, I think there can be an overemphasis on the works of darkness and what we used to be rather than in well, it wouldn't ever be an overemphasis, a full emphasis on the grace of God and the power of God to transform us back into what our genuine true nature is, made in the image and in the likeness of God. Yeah. That that's our nature. It just has to be uncovered and, um, and brought to the surface. And only Christ can do that initial work. And then discipleship for the rest of our life takes care of the rest of that process. Uncovering who we were made to be. I love how Ephesians puts it. That he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and righteous in him, in love. And then and it goes on. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you for clarifying and for waiting in just deep enough for us today. I hope that clarified. Uh, no, I, I may have opened I think up more it, questions than answered. Well, we'll have, have another podcast about it then next right. time. No, I, I think the... I mean, I was reading Ephesians earlier too, that there is there is the the beauty of it is that Christ has done it in the past tense for us, you know, so he's already done it for us and yeah. we just walk in it now. And that is the gospel message that we just walk in mm -hmm. what's what Jesus did first. I love that what you shared on Sunday that resonated in my heart, you know, that Jesus did it first. He was the pioneer for us in yeah. that sense. So, yeah. yeah, so thank you for sharing the gospel message and empowering us to do so with others as well and uh, equipping us to do the good works we've been called to do. So awesome. thank you and thank you for the questions. Thank you for, um, yeah, just for watching and for engaging with us in these podcasts and on Sunday mornings as well. All right. Take care, guys. Amen. Thank you.